As 2023 draws to a close, the world is seeing a proliferation of violent conflicts that merit our closer scrutiny. I will focus my remarks today mainly on Afghanistan, of course, but I do think the wider context is important to set first. Speaker, the further invasion of Ukraine by Russia continues. We now see clear evidence that the genocide and other war crimes have been perpetrated by the invading armies at the direction and with the full support of the Putin regime. This regime practices the large-scale abduction of Ukrainian children, allows its soldiers to use sexual violence as a weapon of war, and indiscriminately targets civilians for the purpose of inflicting maximal terror. For the residual end-of-history crowd, this war should have broken any remaining illusions about what kind of a world we are still living in. Now, this fall, the terrorist organization Hamas launched a horrific and unprecedented attack on Israel. Like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this attack by Hamas has included child stealing, sexual violence, and the intentional targeting and terrorizing of civilians. Hamas did not act in isolation. It has received constant support from the terrorist IRGC, the Iranian regime's weapon of terror. The Iranian regime has long been recognized as a state sponsor of terror through its support of Hamas, Hezbollah, the Syrian regime, Houthi rebels in Yemen, extremist militias in Iraq, and others. This regime uses proxies in an attempt to shelter itself from direct retaliation, but we should be under no illusions about its responsibility. When it comes to war and terrorism, at least in the Middle East, all roads lead back to Tehran. And this is a key reason why Conservatives have long called for the listing of the IRGC as a terrorist organization, particularly since the House of Commons adopted my motion calling for that listing more than five years ago. The Iranian regime is committing grotesque atrocities in its attacks against Israelis and others that parallel the atrocities that the Russian regime is responsible for. These two regimes have been steadily increasing their cooperation, sharing technology and offering each other various other forms of strategic support. Meanwhile, the people of Burma are fighting for their freedom. Following a military coup, the dissident democracy movement has established effective dissident institutions and strengthened itself through growing ethnic reconciliation efforts that include the long-persecuted Rohingya people. Burma's democratic forces are facing the illegitimate coup leaders in the Tatmada who occupy their capital, and the Tatmada is increasingly escalating their atrocities, also targeting women, children, and civilians in general. The Tatmada, the military which claims but does not effectively control the territory or exercise legitimate sovereignty over Burma, is also collaborating with the Putin regime, sharing weapons, technology, and allowing them to avoid Western sanctions. I met recently with leaders from various communities in Central and South America to talk about human rights issues here in our hemisphere, and it was a strikingly familiar message. Persistent abuse of human rights by authoritarian regimes, this time with roads leading back to Havana, including the targeting of civilians and escalating cooperation between the Cuban and Venezuelan regimes on the one hand and the government of Russia and Iran on the other. One demonstration of this growing association is that Cuba is actually sending soldiers to fight for Russia during their invasion of Ukraine. This is, I think, not nearly widely known enough that Cuba is effectively participating in in sending its own soldiers into Russia's genocidal invasion. The government of Venezuela is now threatening its neighbor, uh, Guyana, holding a sham referendum recently to justify potential aggression. The Maduro regime is further stepping up its pressure on its neighbor after the discovery of additional oil reserves in Guyanese territory. Russia, Iran, Burma, Cuba, Venezuela, and to this list we could add others, North Korea, Eritrea, and most critically the government of the PRC. The communist regime in Beijing controls the world's most populous nation and second largest economy, and this regime is working overtime to overturn the concept of a democratic rules-based order and replace it with a dynamic in which domestic populations and vulnerable neighbors can be threatened and dominated at will by regimes whose only necessary justification is power. The free and democratic nations who uphold doctrines of universal human rights rooted in universal human dignity must struggle and struggle successfully against this emerging axis of revisionist imperialist authoritarian powers. We must struggle for the rule of law and for the greater recognition of universal human rights against these powers of principalities for whom the exercise of raw power requires no moral justification. Mr. Speaker, this is the new Cold War. The string of events that we see around the world are not random, unrelated occurrences. They are not simply a collection of bad coincidences. They are rather the result of strategic cooperation among nations who want a different future for the world than the free and democratic future that we desire for our children and grandchildren. Struggling successfully in this new Cold War requires us to invest in our military, to build up our munitions production capacity, to support people who are fighting for their own freedom around the world, to decisively isolate terrorist organizations, to stand with our allies, and to strategically engage the swing states of the 21st century global conflict through strengthening trade and other forms of partnership with the Global South. We must do these things, and we must do them persistently over time. Lifting the new Iron Curtain will require a renewed iron will. 
In these challenging times, I believe we can prevail, but I do not believe that we will prevail necessarily. We will prevail if and only if we make the smart decisions that are required to defend our security interests and our way of life. Fancy socks, photo ops, and cuts to our military are not going to help us in the midst of this new Cold War. Serious times require serious leaders. Our country needs true statesmanship. It needs a will to confront hard truths in the pursuit of a more just, human, and democratic victory.